Hi there. Welcome to this expert interview as part of the MOOC Terrorism and Counterterrorism Comparing Theory and Practice. In our course, we reflect upon the main approaches to the study of terrorism and counterterrorism. So the rational or instrumental approach, the multi-causal approach, and the social-psychological approach. And we noticed uh, a rise in studies um, in the latter category, which partly focuses on both the perpetrators of terrorist violence um, and the impact of such violence on individuals and societies. And I believe that uh, this focus has further enriched our field of study that originally started uh, within the domain of political science and that today can be considered a truly multidisciplinary or even transdisciplinary uh, area of research. Against this background, we're very glad to have someone with us who has contributed to the social psychological approach, our colleague, uh, Dr. Sarah Carthy. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Well, thank you. Um, um, well, you are uh, one of the leading researchers of the terrorism and political violence um, group at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs of Leiden University that Janine de Roy van Zuiderijn and myself are also part of. So it's great to have a colleague here. Um, Dr. Carter, your research focuses on, on radicalization, uh, evidence-based approach to the prevention and uh, uh, understanding of terrorism, and also the non-involvement uh, in terrorist violence. Uh, you also have a background in psychology. Um, so my question is, could you share with us uh, some examples of the added value of the psychological approach to uh, the study of terrorism? Uh, perhaps give the viewers uh, a few concrete examples of your own work and your own approach to studying terrorism and counterterrorism. Sure, absolutely. The, the role of psychologists in, in the study of terrorism has certainly changed um, over the years, but for the last number of decades, there's really been this growing interest among psychologists in understanding terrorism. How does it happen and who does it? And this, this process before it, is, is there something we can get at there? Um, and in many ways, this interest really emerged in response to a number of open calls from political scientists and scholars like that, scholars like Martha Crenshaw, who made this argument that until we have people who study human behavior at the table, the theoretical frameworks we have to understand terrorism, it's going to continue to be difficult to falsify them. And the empirical work which follows these theories might not always have a lot of explanatory power. And this is where looking at the individual level can be really useful. And um, where psychologists thrive is, is understanding human behavior. We're not unique in that regard, but there's also an emphasis on predicting it and manipulating it. Um, and where psychology and terrorism work well is predicting and manipulating, particularly at the level of the individual. If we have all these structural level factors in common, all these contextual level factors, everyone is exposed to them. How can we determine who will and who will not do something? And um, where psychology also plays a role is working with poor quality data, maybe um, infrequent phenomena. And we see that with the project that I worked on, the Non-Involvement and Terrorist Violence Project. And um, many of the methodological approaches we used had their origins in psychological science also. And, and are you still, do you consider yourself um, now a terrorism studies scholar or, or are you still part of the world of psychology that 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 partly looks also into this phenomenon so so how does that change and um and, and maybe you, you can give some also some some uh the, your your latest research is it really only terrorism uh related yes i mean that's the tricky thing about i suppose working on a phenomenon that naturally invites a lot of disciplines and mm -hmm. um, the way I approach radicalization and terrorism is that um, it's a phenomenon that can be understood at the level of the individual, but there is always a risk that if a psychologist looks at it exclusively through that lens, um, we will overlook many of the important contextual level factors that are there. And I think 
the non-involvement in terrorist violence project really tries to bridge that gap. So we look at, for instance, things like the presence of conflict, the presence of political unease, uh, wars, that kind of thing. But we also look at what was the person's educational experience like? Were they close with their parents? Did they have um, a diagnosis of mental disorder, for instance? The mental disorder uh, topic has really grown in the last number of years. There used to be this idea um, that there was a causal link between these two phenomena, but the connections that psychology has made is that not unlike a lot of human behavior, the process is probably non-linear and a little bit more complex than we think. Well, in, 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 it reminds me uh, of one of the key uh, assumptions that we discuss in this um, uh, course is the assumption very often heard, uh, terrorists are crazy. So your your research into the mental disorder um, aspect uh, probably can help us to answer that question. So uh, Dr. Carthy, uh, are terrorists crazy? It's an excellent question. And, and <laughs> yeah. the, the I quest... know it's a very, very simplistic <laughs> one, but it, it is one that a lot of people ask. Uh, and, and, and there's yeah. still a lot of people who think the answer is a clear cut yes. For sure. And you can see why the question would arise, because in in early instances of terrorist attacks, there's sort of this understanding that in order for you to do something like this, there must be something wrong with you. And mm -hmm. especially when we look at lone actor terrorism in particular, we often see that there's issues maybe in personal backgrounds and so on. And um, it's a tricky question to answer because of the, the data issue I made reference to before. We don't always have a lot of high quality data on people. Um, um, but a challenge that faith, the re researchers faced was that um, we had a lot of individual studies looking at mental disorder and terrorism, seeing if people who committed attacks had a history of disorder, um, but they weren't always synthesized together. Some studies found there was a link, some studies found there wasn't a link. But when you bring all the studies together, um, the prevalence rate of mental disorder amongst terrorist populations is below what you would expect in the general population. So that means if I was to go out into the general population, I'm as likely to find a terrorist there as if I went into the mental disorder population. Now that's did also... you say, uh, is it the same level or is it even a bit different? Let's say among non-terrorists, the level of people with mental disorder is even higher than among terrorists or? Slightly, yeah, it's yeah. slightly okay. higher actually amongst the general population. But I mean, there's lots of reasons for that. It could be mm -hmm. uh, if somebody has subclinical symptoms or something, it might not come to our attention. But you, you mentioned sort of this simplistic argument. The argument I've provided there is also simplistic because prevalence rates don't tell us the full picture either. And actually what is coming out of the research now is that yes, mental health plays a role, but it's not a causal factor. So if you are exposed to a certain risk factor, and it's compounded by mental disorder and maybe other risk factors for terrorism, like early childhood adversity or low social support. And um, these create this perfect storm. And um, so it plays a role, but not a not a role. It's not a risk factor on its own. Again, it's the different levels, structural level, group level. You have to take that all into account to understand maybe one single factor like mental disorder. Yeah. Am I, did I understand that well? Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, where psychology can be useful is that we bring in our knowledge from other areas of risky and extreme behavior. So if we look at risky drinking, risky sexual mm -hmm. behavior, even um, speeding in cars, we often find that it's a collection of factors, like you say, even at the structural level too. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think it's also a good example to uh, raise our awareness that we we need a multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach to to answer very simple questions like terrorists crazy or not. That um, one discipline can't give you the answer. That we really have to um, to work together in that uh, respect. So uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why we're very happy that you're part of our research group, and it's also. Uh, why we're very happy that you wanted to share your ideas with us um, in this uh, video. Um, to the viewers who want to learn more about the work of Dr. Carthy, we will add a number of, uh, of publications. So um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for um, um, uh, sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, to the to viewers, um, I strongly recommend reading uh, your work. Thank you very much. Thank you.